And for more, we are joined by Stuart Clerk. He's a geophysicist and associate professor at UNSW Sydney. Professor Clerk, thank you very much for your time. Uh, firstly, I want to get your assessment of the extent of damage and casualties uh, compared to previous earthquakes in uh, Taiwan. Well, I think this earthquake, we've, although the damage is severe, um, we see a, uh, um, uh, far fewer casualties than we have uh, in, say, the 99 earthquake, which was of a similar magnitude, uh, which I guess has been a lot of work that's been put in by the Taiwanese authorities to, to uh, you know, look at building codes and so forth uh, over the years. So uh, that is that is good news. Um, we also had a bunch of landslides and a whole lot of additional damage that occurred after the earthquake. Um, and that seems to have trapped various people in, in various locations, uh, uh, but uh, still the casualty numbers remain quite low. Mm. I mean, they talk about this golden hour, the first 72 hours after an event like this, and they are obviously very critical uh, with more than 140 people remaining trapped under rubble right now. What kind of time pressure are emergency workers, uh, rescue workers are under here? Well, one of the crucial issues is going to be aftershocks. Um, there's been a series of aftershocks following the earthquake in the six hours after the main earthquake struck. One of them was 6.4 in, in magnitude already on its own, quite a severe earthquake. Uh, so that will worry um, the rescuers, but they seem to have quietened down after that six hour period. Uh, so uh, that might give them a bit of hope that they can get in there without uh, without too much trouble. Uh, we never know, of course, what might actually happen. Uh, so those aftershocks could continue. Um, yeah, and I think that there will be a, a rush to kind of get water and food to to people that are trapped, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, in that in that period. So just to weigh up the risks they uh, when they when they're going in as to what you know if there if there might be re renewed earthquakes. Professor Cloud, you noted earlier that Taiwan is better prepared uh, now. I'm also curious, though, was there an element of luck involved? Because uh, my understanding is that they initially assessed it to be a mild tremor and actually didn't issue the advisories as they normally would with, a, I suppose, a, a bigger magnitude quake. It's a little bit hard to get these uh, correct. I mean, the earthquake is happening sort of almost instantaneously. So they try to have some warning systems where they look at uh, quiet periods uh, heading into a large earthquake, but you're going to get a lot of false positives there. So a lot of you know false warnings. So uh, it's very very hard to predict. Um, and uh, so yeah, I, d I don't know that the authorities could have done much about this. Uh, these large quakes tend to happen very quickly, and uh, the only thing you can really do is uh, look at warning for landslides and and tsunamis that happen in the wake of of those quakes. Mm -hmm. And Professor, why is Taiwan so susceptible to earthquakes and how do seismic activities sort of differ between uh, those happening in mountainous areas and low-lying zones? Well, so Taiwan is in a very unique position. It's kind of a trap between two different subduction zones. It's at the point where these subduction zones meet. Uh, so already that that means that there's going to be a lot of seismic activity. Uh, and then you have something that's kind of unique occurring on the east side of the of the island in which a uh, an island arc is actively docking with the island. So it's merging with the island. So something that's kind of an offshore, um, usually uh, underneath the, the ocean, a ridge that sort of a, approaches the island is merging. So this is the coastal range, uh, part of the coastal ranges that are merging onto the island. And so they're being sort of thrust as as that plate is um, the Philippine Sea plate is moving north uh, northwest, uh, and that is then creating a lot of seismic activity uh, just around uh, the the coastal area. Uh, and then, of course, you've got all the the mountains that sit behind uh, in the central range, and they're caused by the subduction system itself and and the convergence. So uh, so this sort of combination of uh, Steep topography and earthquakes make it make Taiwan quite vulnerable uh, in that sense. <clears throat> Prof. Clark, neighboring countries like Japan and the Philippines were quick to issue tsunami alerts after the earthquake was detected. Mm -hmm. We know they've been uh, lifted since, but I mean, how how would you say the region responded, particularly those on that Pacific Ring of Fire? Are they are they 
far better prepared these days, or, or is it still depending on which country we're talking about? Well, it sounds like the tsunami warnings went across the entire Pacific. So uh, I think that was done very well, even though the uh, tsunami was much, uh, I think it was, you know, in Japan was received at about 30 centimetres or so, uh, and in other places was close to a metre. Um, so not as dramatic as uh, we've seen in the past um, in the uh, in the uh, the Indonesian earthquake, for example, in what was it 2002? Um, but uh, it's probably better to be safe than sorry in the tsunami warning and get people to high ground. Uh, so they do quite a lot of modelling as well uh, as soon as the earthquake occurs to kind of predict what the uh, what the tsunami wave will look like. Uh, and what its height will be. It's a bit hard to get that correct because the source of the earthquake is quite important. And so there was some uh, difficulty in pinning down this earthquake in terms of the depth and the magnitude exactly as well. Uh, so those kind of components go into predicting the tsunami and that's why uh, there might've been some errors in uh, in getting it uh, as accurate mm. as, it, as it turned out to be. Uh, but yeah. It sounds like the the response was was very good throughout the whole um, Asia Pacific. Mm. And Professor, uh, earlier you mentioned aftershocks. In fact, there are reports of more than two hundred of them. Uh, how long will this threat realistically be? Uh, when will people there? Can, when can they breathe a sigh, a sigh of relief? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, the There's only been about 15 uh, magnitude 5 earthquakes or larger. So they're the ones you'd probably be more concerned about. They're the ones that you can feel. I think anything less than 5, you you kind of, it's it you wouldn't really feel it very, very much. Uh, so what you're seeing on the screen now is, is you know, a level, uh, is that 7 earthquake. Uh, it, it's uh, here hard to stand. I've been in a level 5 myself, a magnitude 5. And uh, and you can you can't feel that when you're walking around the ground very well, but in a building, of course, you feel it because of the the whole building shakes. Mm. Um, the in this in the seven, uh, you you apparently can't walk. So it's yeah. So I think that the the level five and above, or the magnitude five and above, is what people you know what the uh, rescuers will be most concerned about. Mm -hmm. And as I say, they seem to have quietened down after the six hours following the main earthquake. So there okay. might be some hope that, um, you know, it's uh, safer for those rescuers to operate in in, uh, in the current time. Right. Prof. Clark, meantime, life appears to have, you know, gone back to normal in many parts of Taiwan. Uh, I suppose life goes on. Um, but, but, you know, is it advisable, mm. first of all, and what precautions can resident actually, you know, residents actually take until things really settle down? Uh, it's it's always hard to tell. I suppose in the wake of a very large earthquake like this, they tend to happen um, every every you know we've had four of them since '99 in Taiwan, so um, so it te they tend to be spaced out, um, and so there may be you know some relief following this that um, a large one won't come for a few years, but it is extremely hard to predict because different parts of the fault that are, are stuck. Are kind of released. Uh, so the number of aftershocks may indicate that uh, large parts of the fault are now sort of uh, in in a more relaxed state following uh, those aftershocks. Uh, but other parts, there are several other, you know, it's a very large uh, subduction and fault system in across the whole region. So any any other of those could be triggered independently uh, of of this one. So it's it's I, I don't think you can really relax when you're living in these. Uh, earthquake prone areas you have to be alert all the time mm, all right professor clark thank you very much for your time we'll have to leave it there for now with Stuart clark a geophysicist and associate professor at unsw sydney